Hello, my name is Tony Ingram, and uh, this is the uh, first uh, episode of Walk in the Park, which is um, uh, at least as far as uh, being taking place in the studio here at Pegasus in Ithaca, New York, the um, public educational government access station. This is the public part of it, and uh, my show runs uh, half an hour, and uh, it should be shown several times a week, and we'll show it every week, a new episode. So. Um, so today, we're going to uh, take a walk in the park. I like to go out and walk in the park and uh, every day. I try to get out and walk in the park. I'll walk for a while, and then I'll uh, maybe uh, go um, sit somewhere and look and see what I see and take a picture or sometimes even a little video or something like that, and I like to share it with people. And there's also a lot of things, events happening in parks and issues happening in parks, and there are parks all over the country. And maybe you'll share with me some of the... Um, uh, experiences you have in your parks or even photographs or that sort of thing or um, you know, your favorite park that kind of thing. You can see my information here. This is the um, um, uh, Walk in the Park blog, IthacaFingerLakes.com. I also have a Facebook page which is uh, www.facebook.com slash Walk in Park. You can go there, take a look at those. You can like the page and so forth. The Facebook page is a good way to get in touch with me. Uh, post something, send a message, that sort of thing. So um, anyway, uh, you're going to write that stuff down. I'll go back to it uh, later. So uh, we're going to take a look at some different parks here. We'll, we'll go over to uh, Buttermilk Falls State Park. Let's see if I can bring that one up. There we go. I live not that far from Buttermilk Falls State Park, and I like to go and um, – Walk through there. It's a steep trail in some places and uh, very uh, uh, good exercise. But I like to stop and look at things. And after I sit for a while, I see a lot of different things. This time of year, of course, it's a good place to uh, cool off. It's probably 10 degrees cooler or, or, or um, more or less, or however you want to look at it, in the gorge. And see what we got here. And with all the sunny weather we have, we get a lot of uh, illumination of the upper portions of the gorge that are in the sun, the gorge rims, the trees, the cliffs, that sort of thing. And then they reflect off the pools. And the water has been kind of still lately because it's been so dry. So we get a lot of reflections, really neat stuff. And they make for some interesting photography. This is an area of the glen or gorge, or whatever you want to call it, that's uh, known as uh, uh, Pinnacle Rock. The... Um, uh, you can see it actually in the background on the left there. It's in shadow, but that uh, tall thing there is Pinnacle Rock. It's about 40 feet tall, and the trail goes on one side and the stream on the other. So that's an interesting spot. Sometimes I think I'll do – someday I'll do a little feature about Pinnacle Rock and uh, its geology and also its history. There's a lot of neat historic photographs of Pinnacle Rock. So uh, let's go down and find another image here. Uh, ooh, here's a good example of some of the amazing reflections that you can get uh, in the water, uh, reflecting the gorge rim, reflecting the trees, uh, reflecting the cliff. and uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, a place to go to uh, soothe your soul and have a different uh, pace and a different kind of vibrations around you. Now here, uh, it's about halfway down the gorge, is a spot that's revealed by the low water. The, um, uh, when the water is high, of course, this formation here is covered. And you see no soil, there's no trees or, or plants or anything growing on it. But look at the sculpting of the rock by the water when it's higher. And, and it's, it's the natural fracturing in the rock has created weak places and rock has been removed. And other areas have sort of been uh, polished in this fan-like manner by uh, the grit that high water brings or stones or pebbles or even larger material. So um, I'm going to try to go to a little video of um, Buttermilk Glen here. Let's see. That's going to be uh, take me a moment here just to get that up. Uh, all right. Well,
So um, actually a little clip was called uh, Moment for Reflection. And uh, so it's a nice moving image of the effects there. So, okay, we're going to go to, let's see, where do we go now? Oh, we're going to go to Stewart Park, which uh, is right on the, uh, it's in the city, city of Ithaca, City Park, on the shore of Ithaca, of, of Puget Lake, I'm sorry. Um, and let's see, well, I'm going to put this screen up for now while we get, uh, while we get that one going. That's going to be...
was fun. If you uh, didn't get to see the fireworks, then uh, there they were. And if you did, uh, well, there's a taste of it as well, of what, uh, what you did see. It's probably a nice uh, reminder, souvenir kind of thing. Um, well, that was Destination playing. I didn't really get any of their songs on there and probably couldn't because of copyright. But in any case, they also played last Saturday night, the Saturday night the 7th, um, at Teganic Park as the first concert of the uh, Teganic Falls concert season. So they'll be playing every Saturday at 7 o'clock on the lawn by the lake at Teganic Falls State Park through August 18th. So uh, see if you can get out there one of these weekends. You can go on to the New York State uh, website, nysparks.com, nysparks.com, and you can look under events, and you'll find, uh, you go to Tacanic Falls, of course, and you'll find the schedule. So uh, we have a lot of nice things happening uh, in parks around here this summer. Of course, the, uh, uh, the fireworks at Stewart Park is the first time they've been there in anyone's memory that I know of. Uh, they were at TC3, Thompson's Cortland Community College, just recently, and then uh, before that for years at Ithaca College, and then years ago, many of you may remember them being at um, uh, Sholkoff Stadium at, at uh, Cornell. So they have moved around. Uh, our new mayor, Savanti Murick, and other members of the community and organizations pooled their, their efforts, influence, and resources to bring uh, the fireworks to Ithaca, and I think it was very successful. I'm sure they learned a few uh, logistical things that uh, they will apply in the, uh, to future events. It uh, was sort of took the place of the uh, day at Stewart Park that you usually have during the Ithaca Festival, usually the Sunday of the four-day event is at um, Stewart Park, but that didn't uh, happen this year because uh, they kept it all downtown for a variety of reasons. So here, we got that day at Stu that festival like a day at Stewart Park with the fireworks. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna go to a park that's outside the Ithaca area now. We'll start expanding our uh, uh, number of places we can go. Let me see what I can find here from image-wise. I'll take us down to, okay, this is uh, just outside of Elmira. This is Newtown Battlefield State Park area. It used to be called Newfound Newtown Battlefield Reservation. Newtown was a little community, I think it was probably a Native American community, at the base of this hill. This is looking into the Shimung River Valley near Elmira, about five miles southeast of Elmira, just along Route 17 is the bottom of the hill there. And this was the site of the only Revolutionary War battle in the Finger Lakes region. And the Finger Lakes region was, at that time, Iroquois territory in the 1700s and was not uh, part of colonial New York. A lot of people don't realize that, I think. It belonged to the the six nations of the Iroquois. And uh, many of those Iroquois people had decided to support the British in the Revolution. Officially, the Confederacy of the Iroquois was neutral, but uh, uh, many did support the British because they were afraid that if the British government were gone, there would be no restraint on settlers moving in and taking their territory, which actually is what happened. So in 1779, George Washington sent an army up there to um, uh, try to take the Iroquois out of the war. And they didn't really do that because the Iroquois came back and, and uh, more fiercely and more unified than ever. But uh, this is a picture of a reenactment of the encampment of the uh, Continental Army uh, from the Battle of uh, August 29th, 1779, I think was the correct date. In any case, there's a monument there. Um, and uh, I thought be that being uh, last week, being the uh, week of uh, uh, July 4th, Independence Day, that that would be appropriate to, to show this uh, park here. But I, uh, something else that uh, most of us don't know is that the park is also a great place for viewing nature. The, um, this is a picture from a naturalist and photographer, birder, named Paul Schmidt. And he lives in the Elmira area. And he has a blog which, uh, let's see if I can get his, uh, his blog address up here. Where do where we go? We got down here somewhere. Where is it, Paul? Is it down here at the end? Oh, here we go. There, birdsandbloomsblogspot.com, Paul Schmidt. Uh, he's actually a member of the Cayuga Nature Photographers. And uh, he says some things in his blog that are 
uh, didn't really realize myself, even though I used to work for the state parks for many years. And let's go back to our nice picture there. Get back up here. Aha, of our hooded warbler. Not a bird that you see every day. I so often find myself chasing the latest bird hotspot on the internet and wondering what I am missing close to home. So I've recently explored the Newtown Battlefield Reservation State Park near Elmira. First, it is extremely quiet, so I like, felt like I had the park to myself each time. That makes for undisturbed birds. Second, it's a very good woods for breeding birds. The first time I hiked without camera to get a maximum distance explored. The high point was a hooded warbler some 15 feet away. And uh, he didn't have his camera, but he did go back later and get this picture. So uh, the last two times I photographed from my car, I never had a single vehicle pass me. I could have parked in the middle of the road. It had been necessary to get the right photograph. But birds came very close to a car without locating the person inside. So here's a few examples. This one here is the next one coming up, I should say. A red-eyed vireo. Let's see what he says about the red-eyed vireo. Okay. Aha. As I listen to the nearly constant singing by the vireo. Vireos have a very rapid call. You know, if you're in the woods, you'll hear a lot of them. You may not realize you're hearing red-eyed vireos, but they, their call is repeated very rapidly. I realize which bird nearby, which nearby the gray catbird was most often the gray catbird was most often imitating the red-eyed vireo. So I had to include a catbird picture. Let's go to the catbird. Find the catbird. Here's a catbird. Okay, so he took a nice picture of the catbird. These photographs are a little bit distorted because I took them off his uh, his blog, his website, so they maybe didn't have the quite same uh, pixel dimensions or something. Another one he included, and a really beautiful picture of, let's see, where is it? Oh, this is a... Um, chestnut-sided warbler, and they're very, very wonderful birds. I haven't seen one in a while. Okay. We got, and then another one that uh, is really not that common as maybe it used to be is the brown thrasher. It's a little distorted side to side, but um, what did he say about the brown thrasher? Seemed to alternate between foraging inside the rose bushes and on the mowed lawns. Then my attention was suddenly pulled away to support to a surprise visit on elderberry bushes, a cedar waxwing came in to feed on some of the unopened flower buds. There he is, a cedar waxwing. What a surprise. So, um, so what else has he got here? So then finally he's got a picture on that particular post of um, Northern Cardinal. I've learned that it's impossible to anticipate the one incredibly short moment when the bird's eye has the little highlight and the beak is holding the tiny berry, perfectly poised with a clear background. But at four frames a second, I have a chance to get the perfect shot. That probably applies to the uh, to that picture of the cedar waxwing. I think that's what he was talking about there. So anyway, uh, it's a birding spot. It's one of the um, uh, hot spots for birds for the Shimung Valley uh, Bird Club, Audubon Society, whatever it is. That's uh, what he wrote me. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul Schmidt. Uh, you can see his uh, see his posts on his blog. You can sign up for it uh, right there. Is there's the Birds and Blooms blogspot dot com. Okay, let's see where we're gonna go next. We're gonna go. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to ooh, Watkins Glen. Aha. So um, we're going to move this down a little bit here. Yeah. All right, so this is, um, this is an old photograph, obviously. It's a, a stereograph taken back in the 1800s, back before it was a state park. This is a um, picture of a spot called Pluto Falls, called Pluto Falls because it's in a narrow section of Glen that gets very light, little light. So uh, Pluto was the the Roman god of the underworld. So the, uh, the Victorian owners of the Glen back then, um, back in the 1870s probably, uh, named it for that reason. That's my understanding. In any case, uh, um, photography became a very important way to uh, 
popularize these places, but also souvenirs. And people could buy these stereographs, stereo, stereo viewers, that uh, you take two pictures slightly offset with two different cameras of the same scene. You look through them, they look 3D. And, uh, you know, we don't have much of that anymore these days. This is a crop of that same scene there. So look at that bridge. The, the, they, they had wooden bridges and rickety structures in the gorge that would get swept away by floods and landslides and so forth. So just about every picture you see in Watkins Glen um, was, uh, um, has different structures in it from the, uh, from the 19th century that, that time. It didn't become a state park until 1906. So uh, 1863 to 1906, it was a private resort. It had a uh, big hotel near what's called the Lily Pond today. I think that burned down around 1902. But I'll be including lots more about the history of Watkins Glen because I wrote a book about it called A Walk Through Watkins Glen, Water, Sculpture, and Stone. And uh, so, because um, I used to work for the state parks and learned quite a bit about that beautiful park. Let's see what else we've got here. We're going to go over to Robert Treeman State Park. And there's some things going on there, some updates. I'm in the um, uh, organization called the Friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park. Here's the old mill. And in the old mill, well, let's see, before we go into the old mill, let's look around the mill. There is a new trail map out there just outside the mill. And so you can actually now go to the upper park. This is the upper park. And actually go in there, in, into the upper park and park, and you'll find a trail map with pictures of the features and so forth. And uh, it's taken a long time to get this one up. There's been one in the lower park for a long time. Finally, this one is in place. And it's great So because uh, people do get a little disoriented if they don't, can't figure out the paper pamphlet they get in the map. Well, here's a nice sign. So um, uh, I actually had a role in the development of those signs years ago. So that's a great development. There's also a new uh, trail bridge. You go up on what's called the South Rim Trail. There is a, this bridge was uh, the staff built this past winter and put it in place over an area that uh, uh, is wet and turns into a sheet of ice in the winter. So this is to help people from slipping on their arse. And uh, along the South Rim Trail, now, going back to the mill, if you go inside the mill, let's go back to the mill. You go inside the mill, on the right-hand side out of view here, there is a room, and it's a, a museum. There's a museum there to the Civilian Conservation Corps because there used to be a um, uh, camp in the 1930s, 1933 to 1941, Camp 1265, very active uh, CCC camp that did a lot of work in this park, and uh, other nearby parks like Buttermilk Falls and, and Teganic Falls and perhaps some of the work at uh, the Cornell Gorges, I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, there was a big camp there, and now there's a big exhibit. And this is a plaque within the camp area, which is grown up with woods. There's a little trail that goes through there from the mill to connect with the Finger Lakes Trail up on the rim. Uh, so there's a new exhibit in the inside the uh, uh, the exhibit room for the CCC these are uh, there's a number of things going on there the top part is um, dishes dishes now you see a picture there on the left Neil Poppensick he was the founder of the friends of Robert H Treeman State Park and he learned a whole lot about the CCC camp and the interviewed some of the veterans while they were still alive and uh, these are dishes that were were uh, found in the camp uh, grounds, which of course the camp is gone now, but these are dishes. These are dishes broken because they were broken at the time of use that uh, were thrown in the garbage dump. So there you got them. Uh, this is remains, and these are actual dishes that were eaten on by the um, by the camp members. And uh, so there's some interesting interpretation of those, um, plus a whole big set of panels about the history of the camp. There, there's some drawers that have artifacts from the archaeology that's been going on in the camp. There's a lot more to say, uh, not in the camp, I'm sorry. There's a lot more to say about uh, the archaeology of the park. I'm going to have to finish up here. We're running out of time, but uh, just want to say one more thing. Here's a picture of Loose River Falls. Last, I think, is about September 7th or 8th when Tropical Storm Lee came through, and it did damage to the trail, ripped out part of the trail by, by Loose River Falls, and they had to put up this barrier, and masons were working on it in, into this spring. But I am happy to announce, I've just learned that the Gorge Trail up there is now open and you can see Lucifer Falls. Well, there's a lot more to talk about and uh, a lot more, uh, uh, 
fun and so forth in parks. And I will be back in a, uh, in a, a um, next week, next week when we will have more about the parks, about parks all over. <laughs>